Power. And it's my very great pleasure today to welcome you all to the launch of the Suffragist Map created by the National Park Service and Towson University. Based in the oldest museum building in the country, today the Peel is a home for Baltimore stories. Our purpose is to amplify the voices and the stories of the city so that its soundtrack is truly inclusive and represents all of Baltimore's communities and rich history. In the spirit of making sure that people have access to the whole story of our city and our country, we at the Peel are deeply honored to have been invited to host this important event on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Before we get started, I wanted to go over some housekeeping notes. So uh, this event is being recorded and that recording will be hosted on the Peel's website and posted with a full transcript created live for us today by Gabby from Caption Access. Thank you very much, Gabby. I'd also like to welcome our ASL interpreter, Mary Beth. Thank you for joining us Gabby from Caption Access. Thank you very much, Gabby. I'd also like um, welcome our ASL interpreter. I'm just going to pause there. I think we have a little audio bleed. There we go. Okay. Um, please do be in touch if you have any accessibility needs um, or suggestions. You can email access at thepeelcenter.org. This event will last about an hour. Um, we're going to show about a 15 minute video that's all about the project, and that will be followed by a Q&A with the Suffragist Map project team. So get your questions ready. Um, be sure to check out the Suffragist Map at the link that you'll find in the chat area on the web page where you're watching this, and you can write all your questions and comments in that chat box at any time throughout the, re the webinar. I will then be voicing those questions to the panel after the video screening. If you have any technical issues during the event, you can comment in that chat or you can email online at thepeelcenter.org. You can also reach us on social media. We are at The Peel on Twitter and on Facebook and The Peel Baltimore on Instagram. So I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging with humility that the lands where The Peel and Baltimore are situated today are the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock indigenous peoples. The vast coastal area today known as Baltimore City, Maryland, sustained indigenous peoples until the arrival of Europeans beginning in the 1600s. Over the next 400 years, many Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock communities were decimated, absorbed by larger villages or tribes, and or forced by the U.S. federal government to move west beyond the Mississippi River with larger tribes. Since then, other tribal peoples have moved here in diaspora, including Lumbee peoples. On January 9th, 2012, two tribes of Piscataway, the Piscataway Kanoi tribe and the Piscataway Indian Nation, became the first tribes recognized by the state of Maryland. In 2017, the state also recognized the Akahanic Indian tribe. We acknowledge that the Peel stands on stolen lands, and I would also like to acknowledge that this history and thanks was ad adapted from an original text that was authored by Ryan A. Coons, Peter Dayton, and Ashley Minner of the Lumbee tribe, so thank you to them as well. So now we're going to hear some introductory remarks from the collaborators on the Suffragist Map Project from Towson University and the National Park Service, starting with President Schatzel of Towson University. On behalf of Towson University, I'd like to welcome everyone participating in this launch event today. Thank you to the National Park Service and our many partners in this project, including Baltimore's own Peel Center, for hosting the launch of this incredible resource documenting the history of the women's suffrage movement. I am especially pleased that two members of TU's faculty, Dr. Matt Durrington and Dr. Sam Collins, as well as experts from the university's Center for Geographic Information Systems are involved. Towson University students were actively involved in all aspects of this project, from research to the design of this amazing resource. Through our BTU priority, more than 410 partnerships strong, Towson University is bringing 
positive impact and solutions to our region. And this is just one of several important projects the National Park Service and TU are partnering on. The importance of the 19th Amendment has never been more clear. And equitable access to voting, education, and social mobility are at the core of TU's mission and values. This year, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, we look forward to seeing the positive impact this suffrage story map will bring to the community. Again, my congratulations to all involved in this most important effort. The foundation and strength of the women's suffrage movement was their ability to mobilize thousands using correspondence delivered by carriers to coordinate their efforts. Due to time and distance, they convened meetings in many different locations with the primary intent of creating momentum to gain support for the passage of the 19th Amendment. The women understood the power of using effective communications and in-person meetings to link people social movements and geography without the social networks and instantaneous communications we have today. It was amazing then and even more amazing today as we try to sort, visualize, and understand these relationships across 200 years of struggle is difficult and a monumental task. Therefore, to commemorate the 100th year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, and the history of the women's suffrage movement. The National Park Service has teamed up with multiple entities to develop one of the most comprehensive archival GIS sites dedicated to this event in our nation's history. To see the connections between people and places at the heart of the suffrage movement, the GIS-based women's suffrage story map makes these connections come alive. With the assistance of the Schlesinger Museum at the Harvard University, the Environmental Systems Research Institute, and Towson University's Center for GIS, researchers have painstakingly linked correspondence between the women and men who were advocates for the suffrage. The publicly accessible GIS story map will be used by students and teachers from K through 12 and higher education environments, historical archivists, and others interested in the history of the women's suffrage in the United States. What is particularly exciting about the project is that over the last year, the foundational research and programming of the GIS site was a collaboration between researchers and college students. The students were able to work alongside experts in the field, demonstrating the power of collaboration and the ability of the National Park Service to develop the next generation of the citizen scientists of the United States. Leadership comes in many forms. My name is Gay Bietzke, and I'm the Regional Director of the National Park Service's Interior Region 1. I am delighted to share the Suffragist Story Project with you. Thanks to the work of Towson University and many other partners, the Suffragist Social Network essential to making the 19th Amendment a reality, has come to life like never before. The Suffragist Story Project links primary source material from some of the most important historical document repositories and captures geographically the extensive movement to develop a cutting edge resource for our communities to use and enjoy. The centennial of the 19th Amendment is not just a moment in time. It honors a significant turning point in the ongoing journey for women's equality in the United States. Across the nation, national parks will join museums and cultural institutions in commemorating the anniversary through special programs, social media engagement, and an opportunity through the Forward Into Light initiative to light up buildings and landmarks in purple and gold on August 26th, Equality Day. As we reflect on this milestone, it's important to remember that the struggle for women's suffrage was long and hard fought and did not result in equal outcomes for all women. Women of color continue to face significant hurdles to exercising the right. Jim Crow laws prevented many African-American women from voting, 
while Native American and Asian American women were denied the necessary citizenship. For many women, 1920 was simply a new chapter in their ongoing struggle to realize the promise of democracy. As we move beyond the centennial of the 19th Amendment and towards the 250th anniversary of America's founding, we encourage you to share and amplify these stories by using the Suffragist Story Project, particularly those of lesser known figures and their roles in the ongoing struggle for civil rights, citizenship, and liberty that comprises our national story. Today, we reap the benefits of the tireless efforts of women's rights activists and recognize the need to be more inclusive in telling the stories of all women, of all people, the National Park Service is proud to have collaborated with Towson University, the National Park Foundation, and many other partners to make the Suffragist Story Project a reality. Welcome to the National Park Service Suffragist Story Map. This orientation video is intended to provide a starting point for navigating this resource and help guide you through different features of the site. This story map features suffragists who they were connected with and corresponded with and the historic sites that they were related to, many of which are accessible to the public through the National Park Service. We have put all of this on a map as a way for people to learn and explore and as a jumping off point for their own research and exploration. The map is not only a means to visualize how people were connected and the geographic reach of their activity, it's also an intuitive way to discover new people and places of interest to visit. The map also acts as a gateway as we link to outside sources for biographical content, historic homes and monuments, and letters and documents from archives. Where scanned correspondence is available, there's an opportunity to get a glimpse into the life of these activists. We can see these historic figures as multidimensional people. These letters can show us memorable quotes and radical ideas alongside well wishes to a friend's family and the everyday details that are required to organize people, resolve disputes, raise funds, and push the movement forward. In order to make the information accessible to a wide range of people, we've created several different avenues to help folks get started. One of these is a series of story maps touching on how suffrage fit into a broader historical picture, interconnecting with other social and religious movements of the day, such as abolition, Quakerism, religion, temperance, labor reform, socialism, women's rights, treatment of the mentally ill, and progressive movements. These story maps also draw attention to the power struggles and disenfranchisement of people of color that occurred within and alongside the suffrage movement. The story map narrative highlights prominent figures and uses in-text links to move from the story into the map. Bios, URLs, and images can be accessed through the map itself and through an image gallery section. Social network analysis is also included to identify key actors in the suffrage and abolition movements, people with many links that act as information or power brokers. These social networks are useful resources for students as they promote a closer look to how the influencers of the time use their connections and networks. The centerpiece of this resource is the Suffrage Network Map, which allows users to discover activist and historic sites view connections between people, and access biographical information, archival collections, and scanned correspondence. On the map, it is fascinating to see the vast correspondence network between suffragists and with other people that may be technically suffragists, such as physicians or politicians, but help to push the movement along. At first glance, the network can appear overwhelming, but it's actually very accessible. The many people, historic sites, connections, and how they are all intertwined is a testament to the span of this network. This is still growing and will continue to grow via outreach and crowdsourcing. To show you how it works, let's take a closer look at Emily Howland to start identifying relationships and looking for correspondence. Emily Howland was a women's rights activist. After the split in the suffrage movement, 
Howland attended meetings of both the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association. She was also an abolitionist, advocate for the temperance movement, a philanthropist supporting African-American education, and opened her own school. She's a great example of how suffragists were very active in the major issues of the day. The search zooms us into Emily Howland's primary location, an area that was formerly known as Sherwood, now Aurora, in New York. Emily Howland is highlighted and we can see her nearby niece Isabel Howland, another woman's rights activist, and explore some of the historic sites that are associated with the Howland family. If we click on Emily, we can filter the people and historic sites that she is connected to. Emily Howland is very well connected. Zooming out, we can really see how far her reach was both here and abroad. She was connected to prominent activists such as Susan B. Anthony, as well as local level activists such as Jane Slocum. She was also connected to an activist and scholar from India who was working for women's education and exposing oppression. Ramabai Sarasvati even visited Emily's home in Sherwood. In the left panel, there is a variety of materials related to Emily Howland's biography and connections. We've discovered and compiled a variety of valuable resources relating to the suffrage movement. Archival resources give a detailed summary of letters where we can learn more about different conventions attended, successfulness of the women's suffrage movement, and learn even more about Howland. The scanned letters give us a glimpse into Howland, what she was talking about or what she found important and brings her to life. By using this application, we can not only explore Howland's connections, but we can also explore who Howland's connections were corresponding with, such as W.E.B. Du Bois. As we learn more about the stories and people that we have already heard of, we also discover new information about people and connections we didn't know even existed. We found that the access this tool provides to original correspondence and other archival materials has a way of transporting you back 100 years or more. No matter how much the world has changed over these years, people and their passion for improving their lives and the lives of their fellow citizens hasn't changed. And that as Americans, we're all connected by that. We also invite you to provide us input through our feedback form so that you can share your discoveries with us and serve as a citizen scientist to assist in the evolution and growth of this resource. Yeah. There we go. Great, welcome back everybody. Um, really excited now to get to introduce Dr. Samuel Collins, Professor of Anthropology at Towson University. He is also one of the leaders of the Suffrage Map Project, and he's now gonna moderate the Q&A session. You'll get a chance to ask him and everybody else involved in the project your questions directly. So again, do paste those into the uh, chat box on the webpage you're viewing from, and uh, I will voice them for you, and we'll uh, work through as many as we absolutely can in the remaining time in the hour. So with that, thanks, and over to you, Sam. Great, thank you, Nancy, uh, and thanks to everyone for coming today. Let me just quickly introduce our team. Um, we've got Dr. Matt Durrington, who's also a professor of anthropology, as well as the director uh, of community engagement and partnership for Towson University. Uh, we've got um, Bitha Panya, uh, who's professor of geography and environmental systems at Towson University. Uh, we've got um, our GIS specialist, uh, Christina Nymphus and Alex Mikulski, uh, both from the um, Towson University Center for GIS. And we've got David Spade, uh, not David Spade, <laughs> we've got uh, David Sides, uh, who is the um, program um, manager for uh, the Towson Center for GIS. And uh, yeah, that's our team. Uh, not here today are the many undergraduate students who also helped us. Uh, also not here today, uh, Kate Wilkinson, uh, professor of uh, women's studies and gender studies at Towson University.
Many of you are educators. Um, how are you planning to use the suffrage map in your own teaching and your own storytelling projects? Uh, so that's a, that's a that's a great question. We were just talking about that uh, as the beginning of the fall semester is next week. We're all thinking about ways to use this and, and other resources. Maybe I could I could throw that open to uh, Matt and B. How are you thinking about using the suffrage map in your work? Well, I think it's uh, it's amazing to show um, just the density of all the network correspondence that was taking place at that time. And as we're you know, talking about contemporary networks through social media and a lot of the social justice efforts that are being made today, being able to look back at an historical archive like this to show that guess what, those networks were being established maybe at a different pace than they were today with instantaneity of social media, but the effectiveness of collaboration across geographies and across identities was existing at that point, just like it is today. So I think it's a great continuum to show the depth of activism around you know, different social identities and social justice issues like suffrage. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm looking at it in terms of the spatial patterns, like I'm teaching uh, advanced uh, geographic information system this coming fall, and those um, locations, uh, as well as the timing, we can kind of use to track the changes through time, and we can just kind of, you know, discover in different um, period of time where the movement is moving towards and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Nancy again. Um, we've got a question from Kathy who wonders if you have in your map information regarding Amelia Bloomer. She was a lead in both the temperance and suffragette movements and editor of The Lily. Uh, what, well, yes, we do, as a matter of fact. Um, um, Amelia Bloomer, of course, um, known today not only for her activism, but of course for the term bloomers. Uh, she she is um, on, on our map. Uh, I, as I recall, we've got some of her connections in there. Um, you know, one of the, the things about this project, which um, Nancy just mentioned, is that it's a it's a project that is still growing and being added to. Um, we had a lot of obstacles uh, in this project. One of the big ones, obviously. We can't go to any archives and look at stuff firsthand. Thank you, COVID. But um, when we do find materials that have already been digitized, then we can put those in. So one of our hopes for the future is, A, to be able to go to archives um, and to, to find more material on people like Amelia Bloomer, and B, uh, to get people to uh, tell us the different uh, activists um, who they know of or who are their ancestors, et cetera, and then we can include them in our map making as well. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we also have a uh, question from Carmeli um, and who asked, in doing this project, what were some things that you discovered um, and found particularly surprising or interesting? Well, maybe I, I, I can throw that open. I, I've, I've been surprised by several things, but um, maybe I can ask uh, Alex and Christina, uh, anything surprise you about this? Um, yeah, I think that I was most surprised over, you know, making some of these connections. So, so for example, um, someone that I've learned about in school um, was Harriet Tubman, but I had no idea her connection with the suffrage movement. So. That was pretty interesting for me. It was kind of seeing those connections and then kind of moving between people. Okay, this person was connected to this person. Wow, that's really interesting. I had no idea that, you know, maybe someone from the abolition movement and someone from the temperance movement were maybe, you know, somehow meeting in the middle and talking about suffrage or going to the same association or organization. So that was, that was interesting for me. 
Yeah, building on that, I would say that I was most surprised just by all of the overlap, especially like the temperance movement, a lot of Quakers be also being active in suffrage, um, abolitionists. So it makes sense um, when you think about it, but it was something yeah, that was not on my radar and was very interesting to kind of discover as we worked through. Mm -hmm. I should say, I, I was surprised, well, by, by several things, but one of the things that, that really struck me and actually ended up being um, something for a problem for us to work through were the mobility of these people. And, you know, in, in, in our sort of uh, fake history of, of the US, we sort of assume that, that people were less mobile before and that we've become more mobile since then. Well, this group of people, and, and you know, they're 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 activists, and um, you know, that really maybe makes them more mobile. But they've moved all over the place, not only regionally but really nationally, and uh, you know, moving from New York to Iowa or to California or stuff like that. Major moves at a time when it took a long time um, uh, to go that distance. And all before air flight was commercialized, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so we also have a response from Kate Wilkinson, um, who is uh, assigning an essay in a Christian sexual ethics class on the overlap of the, quote, moral reform movement in Protestant women's groups and the suffrage movement. So the moral reform movement aimed to end the sexual double standard and saw prostitutes as victims rather than criminals for the first time. Is this something else we can find out more about in the suffrage map? Yes, and um, um, Kate, of course, is is a part of our team uh, on this. So, so um, the I think the what people already talked about. You know, uh, Alex and Christina mentioned the way that um, these people were involved in many social justice reforms of the day. Uh, that included, you know, um, all, all kinds of, of uh, reforms with regards to women in general, uh, as well as labor reforms and sort of broad human rights issues. And we can we can find this, you know, these people are embedded in these um, different networks, and um, oftentimes in a, in like a very complex, overlapping way um, that looks. To me, anyway, very contemporary, even though we're talking mostly about the 19th century. Mm. And uh, Kate actually posted another comment on how she's using um, the map in her feminist theory class. She'll be assigning work on connections between suffragists who are typically, typically placed in very different theoretical camps, but had close personal relationships and long correspondences. Mm. I'll have to say that was one of my favorite things was seeing how easy it is to visualize and 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 literally map those connections um, through the map. Um, Michelle asks, after viewing the final product, are there any ideas that you have on improving or adding resources to the project? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, and and we are um, moving into what we can call a phase two for this, which involves adding data and then editing the data that we've already put up uh, and then just sort of making it more functional and useful for people as well. Let me let me uh, ask everyone, but let me start with Alex again on that in terms of things that uh, you'd like to see improved in this during the phase two part. Um, yes, yeah, so I know we talked about um, just making it more user friendly for people um, from the from a technical side, um, and then in terms of resources, I know we were talking about working with some local organizations such as libraries um, to kind of fill in the gaps that we have, um, and also just to get a more accurate representation of people. So we understand that there are groups of people that are underrepresented. So. Yeah, I think working with some local organizations, um, we can start to get more um, connections in our map and kind of yeah, bridge those gaps. 
We um, have a lot of comments and questions coming in now, so I'll, tr I'll try to squeeze them all in um, before we get to the top of the hour. Um, Lori Culver introduces herself, says, hi, I'm a librarian at an independent prep school in the San Diego area, so welcome, Lori. Um, I want our students to use this story map to explore lesser known figures in the suffrage movement. So that's exciting that we've already got people in the audience thinking about how they're gonna use this going forward. Um, and uh, Kathy uh, came back in about Amelia Bloomer saying who, she's not only a distant relative um, of her friend Larry Bloomer, but also is the person who introduced Elizabeth Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Mm -hmm. So again, those connections coming into the uh, contemporary world. And um, T has chimed in, um, who took Kate's uh, Christian sex ethics class and uh, loved that and love what you're doing to uh, add this project to that information. Um, Megan Springate is excited by the ability to add more data through crowdsourcing. Do you want to pause there and talk a little bit about how people can contribute? I know it was touched on, but uh, mm -hmm. never hurts to underscore it. Uh, sure. So um, what we've done is include a link um, in the landing page for the map. Um, there's a link there uh, to add to the story. I, what did we title that, that link, um, Christina? The miracles of modern technology will just look that right up. <laughs> Well, you jump in when you when you've uh, uh, got the name. Anyway, when you when you go to that link, it's a it's a it's a form, and um, you know not every field is required or anything. Uh, we're really just looking for what you can uh, put up for us. We've got um, places for you to upload uh, scans or pictures of of documents as well, and um, then some contact information. You know, if if it's okay for us to to contact you for more um, details. And, and that's it. What we're hoping is, is that, um, you know, if you see someone, um, that isn't, um, being represented, it, there's, in other words, more correspondence there than we've managed to represent. We'd love to see more. Uh, if, if there's people that, you know, you know of or are related to that aren't on the map, we'd love to include them. Uh, and I think, I think, the hope here is that um, this will be a tool for discovery, um, you know, both in terms of the people that we've represented on there, and like, for example, finding lesser known uh, suffrage activists, but also in, in terms of discovery of people that maybe aren't in the map, but are local uh, to the area where you live and that we should know about. Mm. Well, there's already a call to add uh, more Maryland suffragists. Um, this is from Mary. Um, she's very interested to hear about any plans that you have to add, in particular, African-American suffragists in Baltimore, such as Augusta Chisel um, mm -hmm. and uh, Rob Schoberlein um, from the uh, Baltimore City Archives is asking about um, if you already have information on the 19th century Maryland suffragists, Lavina C. Dindor and uh, Ellen M. Harris. Um, so. Um, I was I was just reading an article about Augusta um, this morning. Um, Christina Rouse, do you, do you want to comment on, I mean, one thing that we definitely want to do is to add more people from Maryland and more people locally in general. Um, there are well-established suffrage networks in Maryland, in Baltimore, um, that we know of. The, the question for us has always been trying to get a hold of their correspondence so we can put them on the map uh, as part of a correspondence network. Maybe, Christina, now, any, any comment on that? So I do have kind of a list of, you know, people that we can look into for the next phase. Um, so we can just make sure that kind of all of the people that um, have been mentioned so far are definitely on that list. Um, but again, yeah, working with, local organizations to try to get those, um, get those correspondents, but at least get those people um, in our map. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, we do have Augusta Chisel and um, Margaret Hawkins, our neighbor on our map. Um, no uh, links to correspondence yet, but that's something, yeah, that we're hoping to be able to add in there. Fantastic. 
Um, Liz Cannon has uh, left a comment uh, about what a wonderful project and resource this is and um, notes that for anybody who's interested tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, the Alex Paul Institute is ho hosting a free virtual event um, also on Alice Paul on the 20th Century Fight for Women's Equality. I'm sure there are many, many wonderful events like that um, today. And I do encourage everybody watching to, if you're aware of something coming up, paste it into the uh, chat box on the webpage you're watching through, because uh, this is your audience who want to know all about it. Um, so we also are, have a question from um, M.M. Revel Goodwin about any input from wi the women patriots, the anti-suffragists. So, um you know, one of the one of the the many decisions that uh, anyone doing something like this has to make is who to include and who not to include. And yeah, there there were this formidable group of uh, anti suffragists out there. And um, you know, should we include them or not? Uh, we decided ultimately not to include them. Um, that would be make a great sort of other project is to look at. Mm -hmm. um, you know this this network of people who uh, were opposed to suffrage uh, for women, and um, you know that said, we have a number of people on this map that weren't exactly suffrage activists themselves, but they they were contacts. Some of them were, could be counted as allies, um, but no anti-suffragists per se. Okay. All right, so there you go. There's a, a spin-off project already in the works. Um, could we just double check too? We want to make sure we're sharing the correct link now. Um, could you um, just read out the link that folks should be going to for the communication map? And we'll make sure that's typed into the chat as well. Sure. Um, um, what's that? What's that link? Um, so I think the correct link is in the the chat. It's that towsonu.maps.arcgis.com link. Right. And then that um, the connect to actually view the connections map, it's going to be that last that last tab that says explore suffragist connections. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you for confir confirming that. Um, and I see that uh, Megan Springate has also posted, um, 19th uh, Amendment resources from the from the Park Service, the National Park Service. So check out that link as well. Okay, um, Helen uh, Sewers has chimed in that uh, her great grandmother, Mamie Rolston Bitzer, who was born in 1880, was 40 when she first had the vote. Her daughter, um, Helen's great aunt, Helen Bitzer Paul, born in 1909, described how. Mamie did not discuss her vote with anyone, including her husband. She cherished making her own decision. I find the story striking, as well as my great aunt Helen's determination to keep this story alive to the which is Helen's daughters today. So that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So can people add stories like that? Uh, I think that, that we would, would love to see sort of um, all kinds of different crowdsourcing and um, I think as we start to collect more data on individual connections, um, we'll have to make some decisions about how to represent that material. But I, but I urge everyone to, to if, if, if there's a compelling story in their family or in their community to sort of let us know. Okay. And um, I know during the um, earlier, you, you pointed out the connections that were made even with a, a suffragist in India um, who came over to the U.S. Um, Calamity asks, um, does the map include connections with the U.K. by American mm -hmm. activists like Alice Paul as well? Yes, some. Um, the, the U.K., of course, um, ends up being extremely important for the U.S. suffrage movement, and a lot of people uh, are, are sort of bridging both worlds. Um, in terms of number of connections, uh, I don't know. Any any um, guess on that? Let 
Yeah, I'm not sure about number of connections, but I know, yeah, our focus was um, to focus on, yeah, the, the U.S. and kind of domestic here, but mm -hmm. I think there's about 40 connections to mm -hmm. um, activists overseas. So, yeah, it's definitely a part of our map, but the main focus was definitely the, the U.S. Got it. Okay. And um, we also have a question uh, for you all from Malvino Dalterio. Will any of you be actively drawing connections? And I guess maybe this question is also for the teachers in our online audience as well, uh, between the suffrage communication network and modes of communication and what we're seeing with the postal service and voter suppression today. You know, yeah, yeah, current events, man. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that um, as we continue to build out the site, we're going to be working on curriculum guidelines so uh, teachers can come from different uh, grades, K through 12, but also in higher ed, um, different access points to connect the issues of then to contemporary issues today is definitely one of our uh, focuses. And that's as the site continues to evolve, we want to create as many access points and ways for uh, educators and archivists okay. to use it uh, as much as possible. We have a question um, online from um, Sarah, uh, Sarah W. Any suggestions for places to visit that might not be top of mind beyond Seneca Falls, for example? Gosh, yes. Uh, there's one of the one of our goals on this, and uh, this maybe um, um, certainly came out in the presentation part of the video. Uh, is we really wanted to link people to place, and so we've got a lot of places. We, you know, obviously um, everyone lives somewhere, but a lot of those those homes are no longer there or are being used by you know people uh, as private residences. But when we could, we really tried to link to National Park Service sites, uh, to historic homes, uh, and to other sites that, that have a bearing on the suffrage movement. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, in, in every um, part of the US, we've detailed uh, sites where people can go that, that had some connection. And I think, you know, um, besides obvious places um, th that people really should go to, I mean, uh, we just talked uh, there was a person there who posted about the Alice Paul event. That's that's a that's a that's a wonderful uh, site to visit, um, as as a Seneca Falls and, and and other places. But um, you know, um, favorite spots. Um, oh, I don't know. The, um, my my favorite um, um, the the home where Helen Keller grew up. How about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really cool. um, yeah. How about how about everyone else? You have a do you have a, a favorite place that that's kind of off the beaten path? Um, I think what I was planning on doing maybe eventually once things kind of die down with COVID, there's a lot of um, homes in DC that they're not really open to the public, but you could kind of walk around and just check out. Mm. Some of them have plaques. So like Marianne Shad mm. Carey's house is one of those. There's a few others. So I know some may or may not be open. Um, and then there's also a plaque in um, West Baltimore for Augusta Chisholm and mm -hmm. um, Margaret Hawkins. So I might go over and, and check that out since that's right around the corner for me. Is, is, it, is it been on Marble Hill? Christina? It's on, uh, I think it's on Druid Hill Avenue. Okay. But yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. If you're in the mid Atlantic uh, for the Maryland residents, um, you might want to head up to Wilmington, where uh, First State National Historical Park, there's an amazing site there. But you can then go over into East Wilmington and then also discover uh, mm -hmm. the history of Swedish uh, colonialism which when we were doing research, didn't know much about either. So that's the thing about the National Park Service, 80 bucks a year, you can get into any park nationally. So it's worth a- Very much worth it. So when we go visit these places, can we, will we be, we be able to use the map, say on our smartphones and mobile devices? 
Uh, yeah, it is mobile. It is mobile friendly. It is the the dashboard is kind of large, so it probably would be better with working with like an iPad. But yes, yep. Okay, good to know. Um, and then there was another uh, kind of a related question about how to use the map from Mary. Um, is there a basic search feature to search by activist names? Yes. So if you're on the Explorer Suffragist Connections tab at the top, you'll see a magnifying glass in the upper right corner. So you can use that to search for places okay, or people. Right. Oh, and I see uh, Kate Wilkinson has uh, chimed in um, recommending everybody visit the uh, Mary Bethune house, mm. um, which is fantastic. And um, Catherine Turton has shared a link um, to uh, the, it looks like it's the history of women's travel. So um, check that out as well. And um, let's see, we've also got Montana State House recommended. Jeanette Rankin um, is the person whose history you can learn about there. And, uh, and yet more travel itineraries um, on the visit parks section of the National Park Service site. Um, so I think I'd like now, we've, we're about a little bit less than 15 minutes left in our um, event here. And I'd love to actually, um, in a sense, pass the mic back to you all to ask questions of this audience, because we've, we've clearly got some very, um, expert and uh, engaged people in the audience. And um, is there anything you want to ask of them um, to inform future work uh, on the suffrage map and elsewhere? Well, let me ask, ask people about, uh, we've got um, people in uh, parks and in, in archives and so on. Um, many of you have um, archives that include correspondence, um, and we've 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 tried to find um, correspondence at, at all kinds of different places. Uh, are there resources that uh, we can look at? We should look at uh, in order to build our map. I would really be in interested in hearing um, how people are going to attempt to utilize it in either an educational or research capacity. We would love to hear not just feedback that could also help us develop the map, but um, some of those ideas on how to actually utilize it for, for you know, anything from a school project to uh, uncovering mm -hmm. something else. We'd always like to hear those stories too. Uh, Rob Schoberlein has actually shared a link to a resource on Maryland suffragists. So there are lots of links that have been coming in today during this session. Um, is there a, a, a good place to aggregate those? Can those become part of your online resource in any way? I think that we could we could build a web page of resources and then include a link on our map. So so yeah, uh, we'll we'll work on aggregating those resources together. Great. And in the meanwhile, um, we're happy to do that on the uh, event page on the Peel website as well. I'm always in the of the opinion that the more places you put information, the better. In the hopes that people will find it. Fantastic. Um, let's see. I'm just uh, checking back. There are so many things flowing through. I'm afraid I might have missed a couple. Um, Uh, let's see, we had a question. Oh, yes. Um, so do you have any plans um, for crowd specific outreach for crowdsourcing um, information about suffrage efforts in underrepresented communities? Um, yes, yes. Um, so we're, we're working through um, some of the different partners for this project. Uh, and we're hoping to sort of use that as a launching point uh, for expanding the the depth and breadth of our map. And so that's that's a um, that's my my cue to shout out to uh, Tom Dublin, who has been um, working with a large group of volunteer historians to compile uh, a massive um, biographical database of. Um, suffrage activists and in particular uh, African-American suffrage activists um, that's available through uh, a public portal 
uh, on the on a, um, a publisher called Alexander Street, and uh, those biographical database entries, when they're available, are linked um, from our map. Uh, so you all can check them out. But uh, what we're hoping to do is to to piggyback on all the work that uh, he's done and see if, if maybe people might help us to expand our correspondence mm -hmm. network. Uh, other uh, outreach activities, um, we're hoping that uh, we can um, get groups like Girl Scouts to um, use this map uh, as a form of discovery of activists in their own communities and then to uh, help us through that crowdsourcing form to enrich the map in turn. Um, and I believe that they'll be getting a, a merit badge uh, for that. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and um, then, you know, finally, the sort of part two uh, or the second phase of this project with the National Park Service really does involve a focus on uh, African-American suffragists in particular. Um, but we're also very interested in, in um, 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 activists um, that include Native American activists, um, Asian American activists, um, Latin American activists, uh, Latino, Latina activists, uh, who um, may be in our map, but again, since we don't have correspondence on them, we don't, they don't really um, uh, connect well uh, to the other sort of um, correspondence networks. And we're hoping to really, you know, um, build on that and um, build more complex networks. So maybe this is another good moment to ask the audience as well, if there are any specific groups they're aware of um, that might be good to, for you all to outreach to and uh, get connected to the project. Um, uh, for example, um, Kate Wilkinson again um, pointed out that there are many archives for underrepresented groups in institutions like churches or family homes. Mm -hmm. And I uh, know y'all would love to add those, especially if they can be digitized. So um, if anybody in the audience is aware of these sorts of resources and can share that information, I'm sure many watching today uh, beyond the Towson and Park Service groups would love to know about that too. I mean, it is the end of the day all about making these connections, isn't it? Um, so actually, uh, we, we have at the Peel, um, I'm sure you know very well, uh, Mama Linda Goss, our storyteller in residence, and she's been conducting research recently into black suffragists um, and uh, is looking for ways both to, to do further research and to share what she learns. Um, would there would it be appropriate in a map like the suffrage map for a storyteller like Mama Linda to contribute what she finds, even if it's not in a kind of a traditional academic or scholarly format? It's more of a story. I think that'd be great. I think it'd be an interesting uh, challenge for us uh, to see if we can if we can um, you know build that into the map. And I mean, I, I should say that, that that we've already had had some um, you know some some similar kinds of, of challenges for us uh, with like with like correspondence on you know what what do we do when people, for example, uh, were certainly active and had wide networks but couldn't write. Um, so you know the the idea that we would need to uh, rely on other forms of narrative to make those connections is something that we've been working on. And I would add that uh, the story map platform is very flexible. So um, you know while we've got uh, scanned scanned images and photographs in there, um, audio is something that could be that's great to hear well. so um i know my colleagues at the peel therefore would love to contribute um as matt and sam know we've um, been collaborating on storytelling since i think 2016. Um, mm -hmm. we do a lot of audio recording of stories about baltimore through our app and through our website and uh, those uh, recordings are typically geocoded to the location that they are relevant to um, so we could certainly send you any recordings that come in and ones that we already have in our archive 
um, of, of relevant stories, if you can add them to the map, that would be, again, fantastic to help get those voices and stories heard. That's great. All right, let's see here. Um, another question. So um, Max Sickler asks, does the story map provide links to the National Park Service web pages on locations related to suffrage movement his history, like the NHL Places page? Um, we so we we provide links to uh, National Park Service uh, site pages um, when when available. I'm, I'm 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 not sure about the about the NHL page itself. Um, anyone remember if we if we have a link to that somewhere? I don't think a link to the page in general. I think just to the specific sites and they're kind of associated when you when you find a um, specific like someone who's connected to a place that's where you'll find the link to the nps or or nhl site or N yeah okay um and another really great question when developing the site did you work to make it accessible to people who use screen readers for example yeah, we, we did look into some options trying to make it um, accessible as possible with the platform that we're using. So one thing that we can do is when we um, insert the or the, the different components of the site, we can write like descriptions um, of what those are so that those can be read by screen readers. And then the um, kind of the way that the story maps are formatted the different components and the different headers, they should be kind of be able to be recognized by like the like accessibility technology. And if you hit tab, I believe it's tab, you can kind of, it help, you can tab through um, this site. I'll double check, I'll double check right now. Okay, great. Um, put that in the chat. Yeah, another, another great reason to integrate audio throughout the site too. Um, Fantastic. And uh, let's see, uh, Kate Wilkinson uh, mentions that she's been working on contacts in Puerto Rico through the University of Puerto Rico Library as well. Um, would you all like to say anything about um, uh, kind of Puerto Rico in particular and uh, the role of the suffragists there in, in the movement? Um, well, we've, we've got uh, a, a a few of the the prominent suffragists uh, from Puerto Rico on on our map, and um, again, uh, as we build, we're going to sort of enrich the correspondence network. There, right now, they're they're just sort of uh, standalone nodes on the map. They're geolocated, mm. but they're not connected. And so, mm. the, the goal is to is to get our hands on some correspondence from from uh, from that archive. And you know, the the uh, of course, we're 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 celebrating uh, the centennial of the Nineteenth Amendment. But again, to go back to comments earlier in the presentation, uh, not everyone uh, uh, w was able to enjoy that suffrage uh, that you know uh, came from the Nineteenth Amendment. And um, groups like in Puerto Rico uh, would be another couple of decades mm. before people could uh, women could vote there. Okay, great. Well, it looks like Kate's got some connections to add, um, particularly with labor activists. Um, but the archives in Puerto Rico are a bit underwater. I hope that's not literally. Um, and uh, so I guess when we when we talk about the correspondence, the letters and things, uh, one question from our online team, are there any plans to crowdsource transcriptions? I know we've seen that done by Wikipedia and the Smithsonian and others, um, uh, or even to have pe to crowdsource people reading, um, voicing these letters. Right. Yeah. Um, um, this is this is one of the problems that um, that we faced. I mean, somehow, it, it is so wonderful to have so many digitized original letters and correspondence available. But in a way that that can be a pyrrhic victory because when you do, um, you know, uh, um, tap on one of those links to uh, an original piece of correspondence, one of the things you may realize is that you have no idea what it says. 
<laughs> that um, you know people's handwriting styles um, uh, are or can be fairly unreadable, and uh, trying to figure out what they've written can be tough. And um, yeah, so I, I guess the while we've tried to include uh, illustrative correspondence when available uh, as a digital link, one thing that we haven't done is to provide a transcription, audio or print. And so that's, that's a really good idea that we would try to crowdsource some of that stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Alex and Christina, can you, you won't think of, uh, of any wrinkles in that plan? No, I think that, yeah, I think that that should, think that, that should work. Yeah, and uh, um, especially, you know, one of the, the things that I've noticed um, with, with my children, they, they can't read, read cursive writing at all. So it's, it's like this entire world of, of archived material is lost to them unless there's a transcription. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and um, I think even for those of us who were taught cursive, reading 19th century uh, and 20th century handwriting, early 20th century handwriting can be very challenging. And as Kate uh, comments, it's often a very technical skill. Um, unfortunately, she also confirmed that the archives in Puerto Rico are literally underwater. So that's... Uh, yes. Ooh, okay, so um, the um, National Park Service has a great record of crowdsourcing transcriptions of their park pamphlets. Um, I think another great use of crowdsourcing can also be visually describing the website. Um, mm. Again, for the use of people who might be using it without eyes on it or uh, otherwise unable to see it. And uh, thank you, Rob, for another great resource uh, linked to the National Votes for Women Trail. Um, in our chat there. And I note that we are now um, at noon. And so a lot of folks are probably having to scoot off to their next thing. Um, so let me end by handing it back to you, Sam, any final questions or comments or, or requests of our audience today? Uh, so we're, we'd be delighted to hear um, more from you, resources and thoughts, et cetera. Um, and please um, use the map and, and, and get back to us with your thoughts. And I just wanted to end with uh, a huge thanks to our, our team here uh, and to our partners, National Park Service, National Park Foundation, um, uh, Esri at the Schlesinger Library, uh, Tom Dublin uh, as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's um, uh, hopefully uh, you'll all move from this to other celebrations of the 19th Amendment centennial celebration. All right. Well, thank you, Sam. And thank you, everybody at Towson and at the National Park Service for allowing the Peel to host this exciting event. Um, we're thrilled to be part of this project in a, in a small way, but we'll definitely endeavor to add to the map and, and help build those connections. I also want to thank everybody who's contributed online. Uh, you've done a fantastic job of um, growing our, our community as well as our conversations today. And uh, we will make sure that the recording as well as the transcripts of today are pasted on this on the event page for this event. And my colleagues can share that link uh, in the chat now. And um, if you want to join us again next week, we're going to have a fantastic um, panel discussion about bridging the digital divide. So always about making connections in this time of COVID and social distancing, how do we make sure that we're including the voices and the stories of people who may not have access to the internet and digital tools? Um, so that's going to be Thursday, August 27th at 4 p.m. It's free, you can RSVP uh, on the Peel website. And uh, again, if you have any authentic Baltimore stories you want to share, um, please chime in. We have a free app. Um, you can do so through our website. You can call our storytelling hotline at 1-833-TELL-STORY, T-E-L-S-T-R-Y. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you again and have a wonderful rest of the week.